Good afternoon, and welcome to UC San Diego's Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. I'm Marcia Karakin. I'm the chair of the curriculum committee here at Osher. You can find out more about um, the Osher Institute and our programs on our website at olli.ucsd.edu. It is a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Ralph Greenspan, whose lecture is entitled, Can We Really Understand the Brain? Dr. Greenspan is the Associate Director of the Kavli Institute for Brain and Mind at UCSD. His research focuses on how genetic mutations influence behavior. He is widely published and received his PhD in biology from Brandeis University. Welcome, Dr. Greenspan. Um, so yes, it's a, it's, it, thank you very much. I'm very happy to have the chance to talk with you today. And my talk today is going to be on this very broad question in the context of what is a new, very important initiative that is at least nationwide, if not international, for a, a push in technology and in research to understand how the brain works. And that will really take, take a good shot at getting at this question. Something that people, of course, have wondered about uh, forever, and which is an extraordinarily difficult thing to try to get a hold of. So what I'll tell you about today will be what the problem is, what are some of the hints we have that tell us what might be necessary to get at this question, what some of the efforts, how the efforts arose to do this national initiative, and what my role in it was, and so I can tell you some first-hand aspects of it, and uh, what some of the new directions are that it may lead us in to get there. And the, if, I, if there's anything that is the real holy grail here, it's of course to understand the human brain. But for a variety of technical reasons that have to do with what we, the limits on what we're willing to do to ourselves to, 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 to be parts of experiments, that is therefore also the most difficult challenge. Whereas getting at how some of the brains of various animals that are worked on in the lab operate is still not immediately accessible to us, but at least we might be able to see a path or two for how to get there. So let me begin by telling you what the scope of the problem is. The human brain is extra extraordinarily complicated, as everybody always says, and they say so for good reason. Um, it's, it's, it's the it's, it may not be the largest in terms of actual size of the thing itself of any animal at all. I think a whale's brain is actually somewhat larger than ours, but as it turns out, the number of nerve cells is nowhere near as dense in a whale's brain as it is in ours. So what they, what they have in, in large scale, they don't live up to in terms of its density and therefore how complex it actually is. So look, looked at from the outside, the human brain is this uh, large mass of very squishy tissue. Uh, looked at a little bit from the inside, and this is one of the newer technologies for visualizing the human brain. It's based on the same sort of technique of MRI that um, is used very often in medical diagnostics as well as in research, a technique where uh, images in a, in a, that, that, are, that, are, that are based on sort of physical properties that can be measured inside a very large magnet which is what you go into when you go to the, when we go to the clinic and have an MRI done, we get slid into this huge cylinder, and that basically is putting us inside an extremely powerful magnet, which allows these uh, images to be taken of three, in a three-dimensional way of any of our tissues uh, based on the uh, ability of that machine to detect uh, the sort of the the properties of our tissues. By doing some fairly fancy calculations on top of the, oh, so the basic MRI image looks like this. This is a slice through the brain, not a physical slice, but 
uh, a, 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 a one level that the machine can image. And this shows you sort of the general structure of the brain at that level. Uh, the colored areas have to do with ways that are also used to measure the activity in the brain, but I'll get to that in a second. The way that this kind of picture is produced from it is one that's uh, a result of some very clever modern techniques of figuring out what are the orientation of the water molecules in the brain. And because in a long nerve cell, and a nerve cell is a very, very long cell. It sort of looks like a, 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 long, a long branched snake. Uh, and they're very, very thin and long in some cases. They, by, by measuring the relative orientation of the water molecules inside this tissue, it's actually possible to reconstruct where they are more ordered relative to where they are less ordered, which seems to correspond to where there are these nerve cells versus the space between them. So out of that comes this kind of picture of not individual nerve cells, but bundles of nerve cells in the brain. Not individual, because as the caption on this picture indicates, there are somewhere close to 100 billion nerve cells in the human brain, a staggering number. People always said 100. It's now more accurately known to be probably 86. Still too many for us to imagine. But it's not just that they are lots of cells. It's that they form a very, very elaborate network as well. And so if you look at it by sort of more classical techniques of, of tissue uh, histology, as this one on the left shows, it basically each one of those dots is one nerve cell. And the dot is not the whole cell. It's just the largest mass of the cell, which is where the nucleus is. It's kind of the middle of the cell. All of the snake-like branches go out from there. This is near the surface of the brain, the part that's called the cortex, which is what is the outer folded region that you see in these kinds of pictures. And what the picture next to it shows you is what the, a very, a sort of a cartoon drawing of what the contact points look like between nerve cells where they for, the way they form a network is by having these kinds of contacts that are called synapses, where they come close to each other, and where one cell can signal to the next one by releasing a chemical. So when the top cell is activated, it'll release little bursts of chemical to the bottom cell in the picture, which in turn has protein receptors on its surface that bind those chemicals and activate the next cell in the, in, in the link. These are chemicals are ones that we know a lot about from mostly from the fact that f most drugs that affect the brain act on one or another of these kinds of chemicals. So for example, Prozac acts on the chemical serotonin by affecting where the, how the serotonin is taken back up into the cells. And serotonin has very broad effects on the brain, affecting things like mood and, and many other aspects as well. Norepinephrine, also called noradrenaline, is another one of these kinds of neuro neurochemicals that affects very broad aspects of the brain. When you get um, excited by something or alarmed by something, a burst of that gets released in your brain in various different places and helps to produce the state of being alarmed. Dopamine is another one that's related to that in what it does. Uh, and then there are many other chemicals as well, um, each one of which has its own characteristic kind of receptor protein and the various drugs that exist that, 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 that work on those receptors are designed to either block them or and stop them from receiving a signal or activate them so they'll be uh, more, more active than normal. So the number of connections between nerve cells, between these 86 million billion nerve cells, is a truly astronomical number. Somebody made the sort of metaphor to say it's more than the number of total switches in computers in the whole world. And the number is somewhere approaching uh, astronaut, literally astronomical. So 
what is the importance of that? What is the significance of it? Well, the emerging picture we're getting is that it is the activation of complex combinations of these cells in the brain and of their contacts with each other that produces our experience. So let me go into that a little bit more. Each cell itself can be activated to send an electrical signal down its length. And it is the electrical signals of the brain that are one of the main currencies of how it communicates. Um, it is for this reason that when people who study nerve cell physiology uh, do so in the laboratory, they have very sensitive electrodes that allow them to detect and record the electrical activity of individual nerve cells or sometimes groups of them. And for diagnostic procedures, sometimes people are asked to undergo an electroencephalogram, an EEG, where you have a series of little contacts as part of a cap that are placed against your, uh, on your head, against your scalp. And what those little contacts detect are the electrical fields that are produced by the aggregated electrical activity going on in your brain. So that's kind of a, a, an average of what's going on in very large areas of your brain. It doesn't tell us much about how the brain works, but it certainly in many instances can tell you if something's wrong by whether the pattern of those activities looks abnormal. And then another sort of related technique to that is one developed more recently that makes use of the physical property that electric currents can produce a magnetic field around, around themselves. When current runs through a wire, a small magnetic field is produced around that wire, and the same thing is true in a nerve cell. Now, nerve cells are tiny, much, much less than a millimeter uh, in, in, in diameter, so it's not much of an electrical current and not much of a magnetic field but some of the new, what are called quantum detectors that have been developed in physics are capable of detecting extremely small magnetic fields. So there's another device that doesn't have a skull cap. It has something that looks like a gigantic hair dryer, which is where these micro um, quantum detectors are located. And the reason it has to look like a big hair dryer is because they have to be cooled to an incredibly low temperature by liquid helium. But you sit under this thing, and it will detect magnetic acti activity in regions of your brain and give you a little bit better idea of where things are happening than you get from the EEG type of cap. And I'll show you some pictures of, the ME of this magnetic results as well. But neither of those has a great deal of accuracy. The technique that we have for humans that has the most accuracy is MRI, sometimes called fMRI when it's used to measure function in the brain, not just the anatomy of the brain. MRI standing for magnetic resonance imagery um, because it's based on this large magnetic field that you place around it. Now when, when they say that you're detecting function in an MRI, it's true, but it's very indirect and not very accurate in the following sense. The main way that nerve cells communicate, as I have just described previously, is that an individual cell will send an electrical signal when it has been activated, and it will release a chemical at its end which will activate those cells that it comes in contact with. So for example, when, you hear, when, when somebody says something in your ear, it stimulates the nerve cells that are attached to your eardrum and sets up an electrical signal in them, which gets sent into the inner ear where it contacts another set of nerve cells and so on, and that eventually sends the signal into your brain. And what allows you to distinguish between different sounds is which of the cells in your, in, in, in your ear uh, are activated. Uh, some of them are activated for high pitch, different ones for low pitch, and so on. Or when you see something, again, it's the light falling on your retina that's setting up an electrical signal 
in those cells that can detect the light, which they do by means of a certain pigment. And then, again, it sends a series of electrical signals into the brain. And the way that you see an image is because the light that's coming from what you're looking at is different at each point in that image. Some places are lighter or darker than others. And those different light intensities fall on your retina. So one little group of cells in your retina will see the light part. Another group next to them will see what's immediately next to that, and so on and so on. So your retina divides up the visual image into a series of points, just kind of like that happens nowadays on computer screens. And each one of those will differentially respond to the amount of light, sending correspondingly different electrical signals back into the brain. And then it gets, the processing of it is the hard part. How it originally happens, we can sort of understand. How you make sense out of it is a whole different ballgame. So what goes on here and what gets detected in fMRI is essentially the amount of blood flow in the brain. And blood flow, it, it seems, we now have, have learned, can respond to how active different parts of the brain are. So if one part of your brain is doing more work than another, it's going to use up more energy. And if it uses up more energy, it needs more oxygen. And if it needs more oxygen, a signal will be sent to the local blood vessels to, 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 to bring, more, bring more hemoglobin, bring more oxygen. So they'll expand a little bit. There'll be a higher rate of blood flow to that region. And that's what this picks up. And be, this picks it up because it actually does pick up a signal from the proteins in blood cells, hemoglobin, that are carrying the oxygen. So it's kind of a three steps removed from the actual brain activity itself. It's the activity being cumulative over time, emitting, uh, using, up the, in, in, using up its own energy source, needing oxygen, and now sending a signal to the blood vessels to expand the amount of blood that's coming to that region. So it gives you a good measure over a fairly long period of time. Now, long is a relative term when you're talking about activity in the brain, because this can tell you what's happening over a matter of seconds. But if you think for a second, how long does it take you to recognize somebody you know when you open the door and see their face? That doesn't take you several seconds. That's instantaneous. And nerve cells can send signals incredibly quickly. So we don't measure nerve cell sending a signal in seconds. We measure it in milliseconds. That is a thousandth of a second. And it can take several mill only is it probably less than 10 milliseconds for a signal to start at one end of a nerve cell and go all the way to the other end of even a fairly long one. And when they're shorter, it goes faster. So what you see in a functional magnetic resonance image is a kind of an average over a long period of time relative to how the brain is doing it of the activity that's going on. So that's one limitation of it. Another limitation is that although you get to see the anatomy pretty well, the smallest square of color that's showing up as active here is still corresponding to tens of thousands of nerve cells. So you're way above the level of resolution of what the actual cells that are participating in circuits to do that activity uh, are doing. So it's, 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 an, it's an average in that sense, too. And then finally, because of its slowness and the fact that it's only telling you over a relatively long period of time which areas are more active than others, it gives what we now know to be a somewhat misleading view of the idea. It makes it look like when you're doing a given type of mental task that it's highly localized to one part of the brain or another. And that's certainly not true from any of the other kinds of physiology that we know, or even from any of the work on, on animals. We know that a great deal of the brain is involved all the time when you're doing everything. So the old 
the old saying that we only use 10% of our nerves, of our brain cells at any one time, or, or sometimes people say less, is really not true at all. You use most of your brain most of the time. You're not aware of that. Most of what's going on in your brain is not something you're aware of, and nor is it mostly based on, on, on stimuli coming in or on signals going out. Mostly your brain is communicating with itself most of the time. And because of the number of nerve cells and the relatively small fraction of those that receive the inputs from the outside or that give out the signals that tell your body what to do, most of the contacts in the brain are inside the brain. So figuring out what is that conversation that they're all having with each other all the time, which is more like a kind of a room full of a billion people chattering all at once. What does that mean? And how do we make sense? And how do, how do our minds work that we can make sense out of it? These are really the fundamental compelling questions uh, about how the brain does things. And more importantly, it will have, in addition to answering these very deep-seated questions that tell us something about how our minds work, things that go wrong with the mind, as in psychiatric disease uh, or, or in various kinds of degenerative diseases, uh, will also be much more obvious as to what is wrong, when does it first start going wrong, and then will be a way of telling whether efforts to try to stop it or to reverse it are actually being effective. So, why do we need to see more? Well, let me show you some results that argue for that. This was a series of experiments that were done before I came to UCSD when I was at the Neurosciences Institute just up the road, which many of you have no doubt been to at least their auditorium, uh, if not inside. Uh, sadly, it's no longer there, but during its heyday, which was from, I guess, about 1995 until 2010 or so, um, it, was, it was a very exciting place to be. And one of the reasons is because the director, Jerry Edelman, a brilliant scientist, was very interested in the question of what is human consciousness? What is it that makes us aware of things? And how does that work in the brain? And he had some very good ideas for how that might be true. Hard to approach it experimentally, but let me show you one such experiment that I think is one of the best and most informative about how it all works, and which will make very clear why we need to have the capability to see what's going on globally in the brain at the actual real-time scale that it's happening and down to the level at least of very few cells at a, uh, altogether, if not every cell. We might be able to get away with not seeing every cell, but we're going to have to see a lot more than we now can see. So here's the experimental setup. It's called binocular rivalry. It's an odd psycho physical uh, characteristic that we humans have. In fact, any animal that has binocular vision has this phenomenon. And the phenomenon is that if your left eye is seeing something that is completely different from what your right eye is seeing, and there's no overlap, in this case, we did it with color. So, if I'm, so when I was a subject in this experiment, I was wearing a pair of glasses that had a blue frame on one side and a red frame on the other side. And we were shown a screen with red and blue stripes. The, f the, the interesting thing about this effect is that when both eyes can't see the same thing at the same time, you don't perceive it either. So what would happen is it would alternate. You'd see the red stripes, and then they'd kind of fade away, and you'd see the blue stripes. And then they'd kind of fade away, and you'd see the red stripes. And you couldn't stop it. If you tried to stop it, all that it would do is make the transition more quickly. But it would still be a couple of seconds at each one. So it's as if your brain is trying desperately to put together these two things that you're seeing but because it's getting separate inputs from them, it can't ever quite succeed in putting it together. 
Why that's true, we don't know. But it created a very convenient situation for testing the difference between being aware of seeing something and having something definitely going into your brain but not being aware of it because you're being, here, you're being shown, you're being shown the, 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 the combination of red and blue. You see one at a time. When you're seeing the red, your brain is still getting the signal for the blue. So in a sense, if you can compare the difference in how your brain is responding to aware seeing versus unaware seeing, that might tell you something about how conscious perception works because you're only conscious of the one you're seeing. And so the way we did the experiment is that we would sit there with a little button to press in each hand. And when you see red, you press one side. If you see blue, you press the other side. The hardest part about the experiment was not falling asleep. But <laughs> if you could stay awake, you would give them the results they needed. And then the way they could tell the difference, this was done now with this large hair dryer magnetic uh, field detectors on top of the head. And what they did was to cause each of these colors to flash at a different rate, faster than you could see. You couldn't really see it flashing, but it was different enough that the detector could tell the difference. So, you, so it could see, it could detect which parts of your brain were flashing at the rate of the blue stripes and which at the red stripes. And then what you could do is ask, OK, every time he says he's unaware of seeing a color, what part of the brain is flashing at that rate? Versus every time he says he's seeing a color, what parts of the brain are flashing at that rate? And, it's an int and here's, the, here's the difference between them. This is what the, when you unwrap the skull cap of this thing, it comes out to look like that, where front of my head is pointing up, back of my head pointing down. So basically, this tells you, and, and the other thing that you need to know is that the visual area of the brain, the part that's receiving primarily and fairly directly the input from your eyes, is at the back of the head only. When you do the unconscious seeing, it's only that back area that is light. The lighter the color here, the more active. So when you're unaware, it's your visual area, as predicted. When you're aware, it's a much broader area of the brain. So when you're conscious, somehow, much more of your brain is getting recruited to be part of it, which is interesting. It might not have been what, you, what people expected, but it's certainly true. But it's not only the case that more of the brain gets recruited. This is even the more interesting part of it, I think. So here's the same pattern, only it's not, it goes, doesn't go to white, it goes, it goes from blue to yellow instead of from dark red to white, but it's still the same overall active pattern. But each one of these green dots represents a position of one of the little detectors in the hair dryer, and the lines between them indicate that when you're consciously aware of it, those two distant parts of your brain are now active in synchrony with each other, that they're firing in synchrony, that somehow they're communicating with each other or through some intermediate that links. It's the, this is the implication. We believe that that means that when you're aware, when you're conscious of something, when you're paying attention to something, what's happening then is that many different places in your brain Get are starting to simultaneously signal to each other. That's what we think is the, is the meaning of this result. And that's supported by a great many studies that have been done in animal brains. So you can devise tasks for a rat, or even for the little fruit flies that I work on, in which you are basically asking them to pay attention to something, to one thing versus another. And there are a variety of ways that you can set up a behavioral incentive for them to pay attention to one thing versus another. When you do electrical recordings from their brains, which can be done in greater detail than this by putting electrodes into the brain, you see the same kind of thing happening. You see that when they're paying attention, 
you get this simultaneity of activity in distant places. So, so Jerry Edelman's idea of what consciousness consists of is it actually is actually kind of a simple one, um, and we don't know for sure it's true, but it's a very intriguing idea. And his idea is that it's not happening in a specific place in the brain. It's happening as the aggregate of all of these different regions that start to talk to each other. And the reason consciousness can be so different, you can be paying attention to one thing one moment, another thing another moment, is that the difference between those two moments is the combinations of parts of your brain that are talking to each other. So if you're, if you're, if you're paying attention to a sound, it's going, to be, it's going to have to involve the parts of your brain that process sound. If it has to do with the sound of a familiar song, it's going to have to be the parts of your brain that respond to sound and also the parts of your brain that recognize that you've heard that sound before, which may have nothing to do with that region. It may be a totally separate region or a combination of 10 of them. And in fact, it's very likely that the more sophisticated the task, the more different places in your brain are playing a role in it and have to be able to talk to each other in a coordinated way. It's still a very crude picture because there have to be much more intricate things going on in those local regions to give you the specific perception that you get, the specific memory or the specific recognition or, or, or the ability to distinguish between two subtly different pictures or sounds. That still eludes us. It's another reason why we need this large scale recording. So this is to try to make the case for you that you can't get it from looking at it crudely and you can't get it from sampling here and there. You're gonna to need to be able to see it in a, in, a, in a complete way. By the way, everybody is different. Four different individuals experiencing exactly the same red and blue stripes, four totally different patterns of activating in the brain. So that was me. So I, I was not the experimenter, I was the, I was the guinea pig in this one and these others. CH was an engineer, highly organized brain. <laughs> FG, I have no idea, it seemed like he must have been asleep. <laughs> But everybody's different. Why we're so different is very likely to be the fact that we've all had different life experiences and we all have somewhat different genetics. And you put those two things together and you get a lot of variation. Okay, this is so, 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 so why, so what is it that we think needs to be done? Again, let me just review. What we're really good at right now is telling a, a lot of detail about what happens to a single nerve cell by placing an electrical recording device, a very fine-tipped electrode, into that cell. The best that can be done for something like the, 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 the millions of cells near the surface of the brain are these multiple electrodes that are now made, which are people use certainly in animal research, but they're also used therapeutically sometimes. They're, cases of people who have uncontrollable epilepsy where they have to insert electrodes like this into part of the brain in order to be able to control it. There's a guy at Brown University named John Donahue who was part of the group that I worked with to propose the brain initiative who develops neural prostheses, mechanical arms and limbs that can be driven by thought. And he has made it possible for someone with complete paralysis to drink a cup of coffee by training, by the person training her brain to be able to operate this mechanical arm. They do that with these kinds of electrodes. So they are surgically, you have to place them right at, on the surface of the brain, which is not a great thing to have to do, but it changed this person's life. And so he has said to us that if we can improve this kind of technology from the level of being able to do a couple of hundred cells, which is all that they can do now, which takes a lot of training to get to be good at, and limits how carefully you can move the arm. If this could go up to even a thousand, let alone several thousand, 
let alone most of the brain, he said they could vastly improve the capability of making these things work. They could be more sensitively controlled, and they could be much easier to learn how to control. So we want to try to bridge these gaps. So what do we, so Francis Crick, if I can get this to work, who was at the Salk Institute for many years, he always made a big point of the fact that it was absolutely essential to understand the human brain in a global way. You're never going to understand it otherwise. So now let me tell you an anecdote. How did the brain project start? And how did this idea come up? Because it's sort of a pipe dream. How could you ever imagine to be able to see everything in a brain? Well, the Kavli Institute played an important role in this, the Kavli Foundation. I'm part of this Kavli Institute at UCSD. It's one of many institutes that the Kavli Foundation has founded around the world in neuroscience, nanoscience, the science of, of, su of sub-microscopic level material properties, and then also physics and astrophysics. Started by a man named Fred Kavli from Santa Barbara, who had a very successful electronics business, which he sold and retired, and then decided he just wanted to support basic <coughs> science. So among the other things that their foundation does is to try to get the institutes to talk to each other. So they used to come and plead with us. They say, please try to set up some collaborations with the other neurosciences institutes. And none of them, none of us got along, so it didn't happen. So then they said, okay, we give up on that. Maybe we can get the nanoscience institutes to talk to the neuroscience institutes. Because the nanoscientists are engineers, and they love to develop little devices. And maybe they could be convinced to develop some little devices that the neuroscientists could use for their recordings. So they held this meeting in England in September 2011, and I attended. And for two days, we talked at each other to no avail. They didn't really understand us. We didn't really understand them. Nobody really thought of anything that would be useful to do. But the organizer had cleverly invited a guy from Harvard named George Church who was one of the original people in the Genome Project and had been involved in technology development. And at the end of the last day of the meeting, two hours to go, having an open discussion, the organizer said to him, George, what do you think of all this? And he said, well, I've heard everybody tell me what they can do, but I really haven't heard anybody say what they want to do, even if you don't see how to do it. So at that, one of the neuroscientists from a, another Kavli Institute at Columbia got up and said, I want to be able to record from every cell in the brain at the same time. And that started a very lively discussion. I completely agreed with him. Two of the nanoscientists said, we can see ways that we might be able to get there. Lots of people were against it. And I chuckled when I listened to some of the objections they raised because they were verbatim the same objections that were raised 20 years ago to the idea of the Human Genome Project. And I knew those arguments very well because I used to say them myself. <laughs> I was against the Genome Project when it was first proposed for all those reasons. I said, it's undefined, it's a waste of money, it's not question-oriented, you're going to waste a lot of time looking at things that are irrelevant. I'm the first to admit I was wrong because not only has it been enormously beneficial in all kinds of areas, cancer diagnosis, genetic testing, mapping, uh, economic benefits of, of, of new industries, and in my own research. It's just the idea that now it's easy to sequence DNA it makes a huge difference. So I was completely on board with that. Anyway, it boiled down to six of us by the end of the night. Two neuroscientists, two nanoscientists, the guy from Harvard and the Kavli organizer. And we thought this was a long shot. We thought, you know, it's a wild idea. Everybody's going to say it's impossible. So maybe we can start doing some pilot projects with some private foundation money, knowing that the government doesn't like to support things that are high risk. So we talked about that for a while. But then the Kavli organizer, uh, a scientist herself named Myung Chun, who's the vice president of the foundation, she said, well, let me try this. I know somebody in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy because we've worked with them before on nanotechnology. And he once said 
if you ever run across a really great new idea, let me know about it. So we got home from the meeting. She called him up. He said, yeah, tell me some more. So we galvanized ourselves into action, produced a two-page summary in about six hours, and sent it off to him. And one of the things that we included in it, because we knew that to get the government interested, it would need to have an economic benefit. So I looked up online and, and it, to ask whether anybody had studied the economic return from any of these large projects in the past. And it turned out, a year before, a nonprofit think tank called the Battelle Institute had done a study of return on investment from the Human Genome Project using the standard measures that are done for corporate analysis. And they came up with the staggering ratio of 143 to 1. So we had to quote that in our paper, which we did. And that may have made the difference. So then they were interested enough to start holding meetings of all the institute directors from the NIH and Nas National Science Foundation, DARPA. And we held meetings to bring in more scientists and get more interest going. And by the end of 2012, this guy from the White House office was saying to us that there was a very good chance we would be chosen as one of the major projects, grand challenges that the White House will propose. And so we sat on pins and needles waiting and waiting. And the way that we knew we had been chosen was that the president quoted that passage about the 140 to 1 ratio <laughs> in his State of the Union address. I was sitting here in my office listening to it on my computer. I literally fell off my chair when I heard that because that was our first indication. And sure enough, the guy in the White House Science Office sent us all an email an hour later saying that this was it. We were, we were in. So it was very exciting. Um, they took another two months to make the official announcement of it, but still they eventually did. And of course, in the meantime, there was lots of discussion in the scientific community about whether this was worthwhile. And so we produced some additional papers to, to justify it and so on. And then on Good Friday morning, bright and early, we were all looking forward to a quiet day, they sent us an email saying, would you be able to come to the White House on Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock for a discussion of investment in research? So everybody dropped everything went to Washington. They also invited the heads of our universities. Our new chancellor, Pradeep Khosla, was also invited. At first, he didn't really think it was all that important, so he didn't accept. So then they called him up. So he said, OK, I'm coming. Um, and he's very glad that he did. Um, so they, they, was, they had various scientists from the government agencies and just various major scientists from the country as well. And it, it was clear that they were very excited about this idea. They, what they announced was something that was somewhat broader than what we had originally proposed. And that's understandable because all of those agencies are trying to please many constituencies. So it's going to be a relatively broad program, but will still include a lot of effort in this direction. In addition, what was even more important for us here is that when we got to Washington, I went with the director of our Cadley Institute, Nick Spitzer. Uh, we were contacted by the chancellor, who was in the same hotel, and said, let's get together tonight before the announcement tomorrow. So he said to us then that he wanted to set up something new here to really take advantage of all this. And that he wanted, he asked me if I would be interested in running it. And I said, sure. So basically, we planned out the idea of having a new center here to really coordinate research on the campus in this area. But more importantly, as necessarily is the case from because of political restraints nowadays, there's not that much money available to be able to spend on a new government program. But because the technological aspects of this are so broad, think of it this way. If we can make sensitive devices that can detect activity inside a brain at the level of nerve cells and somehow report those out. And that's the big challenge. How are you going to get the signal out from a deep brain? But if that problem gets solved, and believe me, there are people who think you can make submicroscopic level radio transmitters or, or, th or, or if not transmitters, at least 
some kinds of materials that will be detectable by external means, like fMRI. Maybe you could make MRI capable of actually reading the activity in the brain directly. That would already be a big advance. And we're actually going to start a project like that here to try to do that. Anyway, there will be a very many kinds of techniques that can be used in a whole variety of not only neuroscience situations, but imagine if you can detect activity in the brain as it's happening with high resolution, then that's much harder than, for example, being able to monitor metabolism in the liver as it's actually happening, or how to monitor the response of a tumor to, to, a, chemical, to, to a drug treatment, to an anti-cancer treatment as it's happening. Many of these things are actually much easier problems to solve, which will be solved when we get any of these kinds of devices. Beyond that, and beyond the basic research benefits that we will all experience from this, some of these technologies will probably have uses completely outside of medicine. So there's a great deal of engineering that will go into this. Another whole area that is just as important is the fact that if you can monitor the level of a thousandth of a second ongoing, the activity of millions or billions of nerve cells, you're going to have a lot of data. And being able to handle those massive amounts of data is another big problem that everybody's already facing now. So there have to be advances in information technology to enable us just to be able to handle it, let alone how do you analyze it. And then, how do you make sense out of it once you've analyzed it? So it will require a great deal of improvement in computational techniques. There has to be some serious thinking done on theory for how can you come up with a conceptual framework that allows you to look at these masses of data and ask what might be going on. Because when you have that much information, you can't sit there and stare at it and look for patterns in it. It's overwhelming. Think of the trouble that economists have trying to keep track of all of those sorts of pieces of information. This would be worse. So there's that as well. And all of these things will have such potential that the people here at UCSD who have been quite successful with Cal IT2, now the Qualcomm Institute, Larry Smarr in particular, who started it all, he told me the first time I sat down to talk to him about this that he thinks we have at least as much potential to raise money from the private sector for this kind of idea as there will be government money, which is very encouraging because we can do something about that. And so we are now engaged in starting to organize researchers on the campus to put together working teams of engineers and neuroscientists, chemists and neuroscientists, computers, and scientists and neuroscientists to try to make real interdisciplinary working groups that will be serious about staying on a problem together. And then they will be in a position not only to apply for the federal grants, but that we can also give them some support internally. And the chancellor is helping us in that regard, which means that he has to go raise the money for that too, because he doesn't have it in his pocket. But he's excited enough about this that he thinks that it's really worthwhile. So we think that there's enormous potential here for a very major push in technology that is likely to have very broad benefits. And I'd like to point out that whenever there has been such a major push in technology, you don't necessarily get the outcome that you are originally intending to get, but you always get something that's incredibly worthwhile. So in the case of the Genome Project, it really has barely started to give any of the kinds of medical benefits that were the original justification for doing it. But it has given enormous scientific and economic benefits from this huge industry that's now grown up of DNA sequencing. And that's a fairly narrow slice of the world. Another good example of this that is not well recognized is the war on cancer from the 1970s. It's generally assumed that that was a failure because it didn't cure cancer. But what it did do was to create the technology that created the biotechnology industry. 
the whole ability to clone genes and to understand what genes are and to isolate them and isolate what they make and what their products do, that all grew up as a result of the funding that went into the war on cancer, which in turn made it possible for us to, to know what cancer is, which in turn made possible the first efforts to make drugs and treatments that are actually targeted at the specific characteristics uh, of different kinds of cancer. So in both of, in both of those prior cases, this major push didn't necessarily meet the original expectations, but it fulfilled a whole other set of them, which is hard to deny the benefit of. This one, I think, will, may be even broader in, in, in its impact, because it's not just biomedical. It really is engineering as well. And I have to say that nobody on the campus is more excited about this than the engineers. I've been going around to all of the departments talking to them, and they can't wait, basically. So we've started doing a kind of a science version of Match.com to try to get people interested in the same problem working together. And we're going to start holding some meetings to try to encourage those teams to form, and then try to give them some support. So I hope that as time passes, we'll have things to report to you about what we've found, what we've developed, and what that has made it possible for us to do. And uh, I'm quite confident that if we were able to continue along the line that we started, that, that that will happen. So I thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to take your questions. <laughs>